it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Phil Alvelda is a former uh, program manager at DARPA's Biological Technologies Office. Um, many people have asked him if he's still there, but he's left. Um, at DARPA, he developed national scale R&D programs um, to develop techno technologies at the intersection of engineering and biology, including the NSDE program. Um, and he is now the founder of Cortical AI, which I'm hoping that he'll tell us a bit about now. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Lisa. It's, uh, it's always great to be back at MIT. And uh, in this particular case, I'm, I'm excited to come back and report on a mission that really started in this building a couple floors down uh, in a brainstorming session with Ed Boyden and Joey and Nicholas and a few of the other uh, uh, you know, MIT uh, folks, um, really to think about what are the new technologies that might really quite substantially advance uh, neural interface. And, and so I'd like to give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to be at DARPA and, and try and come up with these programs and make decisions about what could be most impactful. Uh, some of the early results uh, that, that are public um, and then give you some idea of what is the promise and portent of some of these developments and how they can be applied not just as a universal neural interface to biological wetware, but how we can start taking some of the things that we've learned and, and begin applying them to interface artificial neural systems uh, to perhaps build next generations of artificial intelligence. Can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. So I think the first point is that uh, this mission of trying to understand what the brain is doing, and in particular, not just to read and, and see what the activity of the brain is, but be able to write artificial stimulation and, and cause sensation from our interaction, uh, has been an ongoing effort since the 50s. And, and the challenge, of course, is that, OK, now, of course, it goes. Uh, there we are. It, it, it was, it was the, the experiment of having to be so invasive because we couldn't really see what was happening inside the brain to develop probes, probes that we would actually plug into the, the cortex of the monkey, in this case, the beginning of the revolutionizing prosthetics program in Miguel Nicolelis's lab at Duke, where the, you can get hidden by the little uh, aluminum structure there, but you have a mouse with a, a tiny little plug in the cortex, 100 wires coming out, uh, and he is controlling the robot arm to feed himself from the marshmallows as they are dispensed. His own arm is trapped in that uh, little tube, so he can't use it. Uh, but this was a watershed moment where, for the first time, you could see an actual connection to a physiological system where an animal was controlling an electronic system with their thoughts. Of course, it wasn't long after that that uh, we extended this work uh, to the, um, the, par the quadriplegic patient, Jan Sherman, in the same revolutionizing prosthetics program, where, uh, again, even more of a watershed moment where the advanced arm was installed. The famous 60 Minutes interview. And, and it really is amazing. And, and, and that was a, an incredible moment where you could not see just the promise in, in an animal experiment and a technology demonstration, but for the first time that we humans could foresee a future where our direct mental control over the world around us was possible. Now, since then, we've, we've also uh, worked on the reverse path. And this was a program I had a, a chance to participate in. It was Doug Weber's haptics program where now we're putting the electronic sensors in the fingertips of the robot and in the joints so that when the patient touches something, they can, they can feel it uh, as if their own hand is, uh, is working. Uh, and you can see some of the demonstrations that, that were performed as a result, um, as well as you know, the proprioceptive feedback to detect uh, you know, where your arm, how flexed it is without looking at it. Um, so the, the progress was remarkable. And it's a little bit difficult to say, all right, well, we can wire now directly to the peripheral nervous system in the stump of the arm. Or in this case, again, this is a dual implant surgery where one uh, probe of electronic wires was in the motor cortex. Another was behind it, one sulci back into the, uh, into the um, uh, sensory cortex. Uh, 
So again, you have control and perception all in one closed loop system. And the feedback from the, uh, the users was fantastic. Uh, we had uh, wounded veterans who would be equipped with these arms that have the sensor system. Even with the old prosthetics, with the, 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 the digital control from the nervous system, they would say things like, yes, it was much better than the hook, and I could grab things, but I'd always have to concentrate and look at it again. And you know, I, I, became, I had to become left-handed when I lost my right arm. But when I got the new prosthetic with the sensory feedback, I became right-handed again. And of course, they were thinking of the prosthetic not as a prosthetic, but as their hand. And so that was, that was a really, uh, really impactful program, still ongoing. But I think one of the really remarkable things about all of those technology demonstrations is that this was the technology that it was based on. 100 wires, a few millimeters square. What, 1960s technology, maybe? You know, this was the first system that was pushed through the FDA at enormous expense and time to the point where it was allowed as an implant in a human. So I came to this situation brainstorming here in this very building. Well, what if we could apply the very latest CMOS and photonics technologies? What would be a reasonable aspiration? Because, of course, we have this huge bottleneck between the trillions of synapses in the brain and the trillions of transistors and wires on the, on the silicon we can build. And, of course, we, we've got a 10 orders of magnitude bottleneck sitting in the middle. And so my goal was to fix that, really advance the field. And so I, I started the NESDI program. And here, I, I want to say, I am no longer part of DARPA. Anything I say here is my own representation and does not represent in any way uh, the goals or aspirations of even this program. Uh, actually, that's now run by Al Amandi, who is right here in the audience. So you can get the official word from him. What I'm giving you is a retrospective perspective of what are some of the thoughts and goals that we had when we constructed this program originally, uh, and some of our hopes at that time. But really, the aspiration was very, very simple. We wanted to enable a next generation of neural interfaces specifically for human use. And we went through a really exhaustive study of, from first principles. What is a reasonable DARPA hard, most people will think it's impossible, but possibly doable if we could but circle the best technologists on the planet, the best scientists on the planet, to make it possible. And so we started with this aspiration of being able to read a million neurons and, and write slightly less than that. And when we issued this, um, most people said, that's ridiculous. That's impossible, which is a good feedback for a DARPA program manager, because you know you haven't made the task too easy. But there was a lot of concern, a lot of hand-wringing. Do we really think we can get to that level of atomic function at that low energy, at that low thermal load, and so on? But that was our goal. And more than that, the goal was to make a universal interface because a lot of the cortical architecture is common across the entire brain. And so we wanted a platform where whichever part of the brain you would like to interface with, you could make a device, and simply by moving it, you could access different areas of the brain. And there might be different application needs for the different parts of the brain, but there's certainly uh, common physics, common chemistry, uh, common telemetry power, packaging types of requirements that would drive it. And so we didn't really know what the form factor would be, but when we did our calculations of energy and power and uh, you know, neural interface technologies and, and scale and precision, uh, we figured you could make something about the size of a couple nickels back to back, uh, and whichever part of the brain that you wanted to connect it over, you could build some sort of interface that would do it. Um, and so in a sense, this idea of a universal neural interface was exploiting the very notion that we had even before DARPA was in the picture. That looking back at the internet revolution, when we went from the ARPANET of about 1,000 nodes to the exponential growth of the internet proper, the, the knee in the curve was triggered by the commercialization of the 3Com Ethernet modem, where you modularized the part that connected the individual computers to a common network backbone. And so the argument was, what we need is a universal modem that whichever part of the brain you'd like to connect at high bandwidth to external systems, you have an, a system and an architecture that's not so much a bespoke technology demo, but something that a manufacturing industry could, you know, a, a nascent one, admittedly, could begin to, to pull together. And so this was really the, the primary goal of setting up a program like this, was, you know, who can build it? Who has the technology? Who has the expertise to make it happen?
And one of the real challenges we discovered very, very early was the big companies, even the ones in the neurotechnology space, were not pushing and did not, in fact, have the new science and technologies necessary to drive state-of-the-art neural interfaces significantly beyond what they were doing with the deep brain stimulators. The university laboratories had some of the technology and the science, but they didn't have the manufacturing wherewith all of the commercial potential or the ability to manage the regulatory process. And so in between them, you, you needed someone who could take the university innovations right away and transfer them into a form and commercialize it, work with the foundries that had the very latest technologies, work with the companies that had the very latest compute telemetry, power delivery like Qualcomm, and bridge the university to the big company. So structuring the, the, the requirements for the program in many ways was, a, was an exercise in saying, well, we need the universities, you need the startups as the bridge, you need the big companies to manage the regulatory and the distribution, um, and you need the participation of the FDA and the regulatory machinery from the beginning. And so ultimately, we, we funded six different groups, uh, over 40 different institutions. So the teams were large uh, collections of, of collaborations that brought all the technologies together. Um, quick review of some of the, so you can get an idea of the range and how um, technologists at DARPA think of portfolios of technology to manage risk and to try different approaches and cover different opportunities and needs. Uh, one of the first ones was led by Ken Shepard at uh, Columbia University, where they're taking entirely integrated, so it's a single piece of silicon that has all of the electrodes for sensing, stimulation, power reception, um, processing, uh, telemetry, two ways, uh, and it's thin to the point where it's more flexible than a sheet of tissue paper and can just be layered across the surface of the brain. And so the prospect here is that you have kind of a bi-directional sensor and stimulator, similar to what you, know, you would call an ECOG array, but now you've got kind of megapixel accuracy with you know, five to 10 micron pixels. And the prospect of being able to sense and stimulate individual neural activity at a meaningful scale in a nice monolithic unit that, uh, that you could actually imagine implanting, you know, not even implanting, implanting is the wrong word, just kind of laying over the surface of the cortex and even closing up the skull uh, and then having a relay outside to, uh, to address it wirelessly. Another effort <clears throat> that was also very important, thinking about applications like uh, being able to treat aphasia or uh, imagined speech uh, was a really interesting type of application that required a more distributed interface with the brain. You still need the scale, but perhaps on a more widely uh, spaced or dispersed set of contacts across the brain. So in this case, we funded Paradromics, uh, led by Matt Engel, uh, to have a system of very, very tiny microwires that were so thin that they displace very, very little tissue in insertion uh, and, and can actually kind of inveigle themselves through blood vessels without breaking them. Uh, I should say around blood vessels rather than through them. And, and so this was, uh, this was a really interesting project where the feasibility of the technology was there. Of course, each of these are bound to their respective demons. This one is, you know, what is the histology of you know, thousands or millions of wires uh, that are implanted uh, relative to the older you know, Utah arrays with the hard electrodes? Certainly much better, but at the larger scale, what's the impact? Still don't know. But we're certain that this approach will be a vast improvement over uh, you know, the almost big pen sized deep brain stimulators and will offer a massively improved specificity of which tissue you interact with. Um, also in the distributed system strategy, uh, this was a really interesting approach led by Arto Nurmiko at Brown, where they have uh, essentially these individual neural grains which they can implant individually in widely dispersed areas. Uh, and they contracted with Qualcomm to effectively build a, what looks like a, a cellular relay between the distributed uh, grains and the external world. And one of the things that's really interesting about this one is that uh, there's a mechanism to have just not just you know, a reading system that reads out to the rest of the world or a write system that takes uh, world information and writes it into the brain, but this is the sort of thing where you can imagine a short link where you can make artificial linkages between remote parts of the brain that have some sort of connectivity lesion uh, and, and repair local networks and not just have I.O. So there's a broad range of therapies that you can imagine uh, with this technology. Now, getting to some of the more um, farther out, potentially riskier, but more impactful technologies, uh, and in fact, <clears throat> one of the areas that really drew me to the notion of, you know, could we really make a kind of a million channel scale neural interface 
were this range of new optical technologies, where some of the things that, uh, that uh, Dr. Church was talking about in terms of using synthetic biology and, and, and uh, programming neurons essentially to fluoresce when they, when they fire or uh, you know, inserting uh, opsin channels that are light sensitive when you shine a laser or an LED light on them, you can cause a channel to open up and stimulate a neural activity uh, with the, the optical right. Um, this was a, pro a project led by Vince Pirabone at Yale where uh, they were developing a kind of a combination of a micro LED stimulator with a very, very high precision flat camera using computational optics with, uh, from, from Rice. And this is a, a really interesting project. It's hard to see with this lighting, uh, but the, the foundation of it was to move away from um, fluorescence as a requirement for imaging and start to uh, do the biochemistry work to figure out how do these organisms like tenophores uh, generate endogenous um, luciferins and luciferases to luminesce and then do the same work that they did before for voltage indicators to make a voltage indicator that emits light when there's neural activity. So you lose the background radiation and noise. That's a big problem with some of the fluorescent imaging technologies. Uh, and you need some clever sensing technology to improve the uh, sensitivity of the camera. And that came from Columbia with their ultra high resolution um, sensors. Uh, St. Andrews at, uh, at uh, Scotland is contributing super high efficiency blue LEDs for the stimulators. Uh, you can kind of see the difference between prior work and the efficiencies of the new devices out of St. Andrews. Uh, but the microstimulation strategy is very, very simple. Not clear it's going to get very deep in the brain, but the architecture is so simple, the device is so simple, the fabrication is so simple that we thought for stimulating the upper layers of the cortex it would be a very attractive option. The flat camera is also a super interesting technology which gets rid of a lot of the volume and offset requirements of traditional optics to do this type of imaging simply by having a phase mask. And they've demonstrated you know, submicron resolution uh, you know, with a couple hundred microns of offset uh, from, the, uh, from the image plane. So fantastic work in integration uh, for a package that is very, very non-invasive. There's kind of extensions of that that start to become more sophisticated, uh, where we have funded uh, uh, Udi Isakoff at, at Berkeley, uh, Paris, and, and so on, to build essentially a holographic stimulator, which now can begin incorporating automatic uh, stimulus at different depths, as well as phase adjustment technologies to compensate for scattering and, and a few other ideas. Uh, but of course, now you start to see that the image system starts to become more complex with folded optics and offsets. Uh, so you know, we're, we're eager to see what sort of performance and, and penetration and, and scattering mitigation uh, can come about from the process. Uh, but there's probably going to be more work to do in this one to see it in uh, ultimate human use and integration. Uh, but still, very, very exciting. Uh, the last one I want to talk about uh, has a similar approach in optical stimulation. This one is led by uh, Jose Sahel at the uh, Foundation for Vision and Hearing in Paris. Uh, he also now has a joint appointment at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, but another multidisciplinary team from Stanford, uh, Friedrich Mischer Institute uh, in Basel, uh, a couple of startups for the camera technologies, the genetics. But what's really particularly interesting about this effort is the fact that uh, they have the capability to write genetic instructions to individual species of cells. And, and here, we see this as a critical advance because the, the electronics technology that you can't steer, that when you put an electrode in and you stimulate the inhibitory and the excitatory neuron at the same time, you're losing a tremendous amount of the actual code that represents precision signals in the retina. You can actually stimulate, but what you get with broad electrical stimulation is a phosphine. It's a big blurry dot. You don't get edges. You don't get motion. You don't get corners. You don't get precision imagery of being able to look at an HD screen and notice when a dot of one pixel moves across the screen. Your eye can do this from 10 feet away, but with phosphenes, you know, you've got a you know, 10, 15 degree dot. Not very useful for precision vision. But this sort of system, multiple channels of address, independent stimulatory and inhibitory, the opportunity to address and time multiplex uh, individual neural species directly writing into the cortex to create artificial vision is the target. Now, to give you an idea of how rapidly those technologies progressed, uh, this was before we even started the NESDI program from Mark Schnitzer's lab in Stanford. You can see a mouse running in a track. Uh, the circle is, the, is on the image of the actual hippocampal area. 
tracking the motion of the mouse. Every time he passes that triangular protuberance in the downward direction, the total energy in the circle, you can see that one neuron fires. So he can make maps using this kind of technology to see what's computing in the cortex. Now, just as the uh, program was starting, so about a year later, this is what the technology looked like, where he's looking at the entire brain from the visual cortex all the way through to the frontal cortex of the mouse, uh, doing all of the visual interpretations. He's on a treadmill with a screen being presented images. And now, with precision, they can take the visual stimulus and compare it to each stage of neural processing through the system and partake and, and, and partition out what are the individual elements at the individual neural level of the code representing the, you know, the precision imagery that the mouse reacts to. And then you can zoom in and get a little bit better view and then apply some image processing so you can really see the individual neural activity with high precision. So now, of course, we have proof of principle. And what's even more exciting is the scale at which this is working. So even before the NSD program started, they were looking at about a million and a half neurons across the entire cortex of the mouse and starting to develop tools uh, to automatically partition and segment the individual neurons and trace the activity of those, those systems, um, which of course brings up an interesting question of scale. And how do you manage things like computational load or thermal load or telemetry requirements for a data stream? So let me give you a point of reference from the revolutionizing prosthetics program where we had the 100 wires, um, you know, very coarse. Each one of those wires was sampling the activity of tens of thousands of neurons. The signal doesn't look anything like a neural pulse train. It's a big, noisy agglomeration of thousands of those, background activity. And so it was a huge denoising problem. <coughs> and the way we resolved it was we sampled the hell out of it. 60 megabits of, you know, 96 channels, 16 bits at 30 kilohertz, and then you have a big refrigerator of electronics to kind of downsample all the way to about five kilobits per second, extracting about five degrees of freedom to drive the robot arm that you saw in the video demonstration. But now imagine what we need to do for, for a NSD type approach where we want a million channels. What does that do to the system that, that we need to integrate? Well, even if you figured out some compressibility idea, you know, there clearly needs to be something about the neural signal that's, that's compressible so that you can efficiently telemeter it out. And so this is when we realized that moment that in terms of designing the integrated system, it wasn't enough to have a million channels. You had to have a million channels that could sample individual neurons so that the signal was compressible enough that you could manage the, the data stream. So, that's, so for the core system integration and the way we structured the whole program, we realized it wasn't enough to solve one problem. You had to solve them all collectively and, and leverage the strengths of one technology to overcome the weaknesses in other areas. So this is a great example of scale and precision requirement. Uh, obviously, we wanted code to go from digital bit streams back to images. But the question was, what code? What code? Shannon Hartley, you can take a digital channel. You can look at the signal to noise of the system and, and of course, estimate what, what information capacity that channel will have. And so the naive assumption is we'll take an axon of a nerve, kind of start calculating what the, uh, the bit stream, the, the firing rate is, take average firing rates, uh, and you can come up with some sort of expression of how it's encoded uh, you know, according to what's active and what's not. But it turns out that this, we now know, clearly is wrong. And it's a simple exercise, you count all the you know, nerve axons in a bundle. Uh, you measure how fast they can switch. And you come up with a, a noise level. And you can, come, you, know, you can figure out what the information capacity of that channel is. But then when you do the physiological experiments, you know, how finely can you discriminate two tones that are apart? How, how finely can you use your eyes to discriminate lines that are offset? And you realize that biology does somewhere between 10 and 100 times better than the digital abstraction would afford. And so the goal for us was to come up with this coding and figure out just what the right expression might be. So I'll fast forward to really the, the core goal was that the asynchrony of the digital signal, the individual sparse activation of the neurons required a new generation of electronics that would act like your retina, only be active when there's new information, and deliver the technology and the, and the system information at a tiny fraction of the bandwidth that you would need for a traditional computing architecture. And it's only when you have this kind of bridge of a new technology that behaves, acts, and consumes power like the neural systems 
uh, can you develop a system that will preserve the temporal information the way your eye does. And so these are the kinds of technologies that we would like to employ, not just for artificial, uh, not for biological interfaces, but to build artificial intelligent systems. And that's what I started Cortical AI to do. And if anyone's curious about hearing more about that, come find me at lunch. Thank you. <laughs>